Let's find, uh, okay, everybody's coming in right now. Awesome. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Z Call. And uh, see if I can pop this out. Uh, we'll get started in a minute, like usual. Uh, we're just waiting for everybody to get in here. It takes a minute to get everybody in, in the door. Uh, there's a lot of you, and uh, and so we just want to make sure everybody gets here. So get yourselves uh, situated. This is going to be a good call. Um, apathy is one of the toughest energies for people to get out of. So um, you know, having a discussion about it, breaking it down, and talking about it a little more can be a, a very powerful topic for people uh, basically moving forward, um, making changes. It took me a while to climb out of this area of my life, and um, and uh, but. You know, you, once you start getting really out of it, boy, do you see differences in, in how much you create and manifest and experience. It's, it's pretty amazing, actually. Hold on, I'm trying to get a zoom back up on the screen here. It disappeared on me. Ah, uh, that's why it, it didn't pop out. Huh, interesting. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna have to move this so I can talk. It's not doing what I want it to do. So I'll wait for Anthony to start talking and I'll fix it. Um, welcome to the call, everybody. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about getting out of apathy, like I said. Uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes, there's gonna be more people coming in. So, um, but we'll go ahead and get started because you guys are on time. It's actually about five minutes past 11. And we've got Anthony here. Um, who really worked his ass off to get out of apathy. Um, I've told the story about him running away at his first workshop. And it's, it's a great story. You know, we took him out uh, on Saturday night um, and he actually snuck home. He didn't want to be there. And he was really beating himself up, wanted to quit, and didn't want to come back because he thought he couldn't do it. But he came back the next day anyways, showed up and kept just working and working and started climbing out. And throughout the years, Anthony's had many bouts of apathy. As a matter of fact, we... Uh, we used to watch him falling asleep in the back of the room all the time because one of the apathy is to start to fall asleep. Uh, sometimes when, you, when there's no reason to, you just get tired, you, your body gets tired because you're wanting your body's wanting to shut down it's when the body has the least amount of energy. So Anthony's body, uh, just like mine used to, was was really getting tired all the time whenever he started to grow. It's the way that the ego is trying to defend itself. And it's a powerful mechanism. It gets you to stop a lot. And so we did a lot of work with that. Uh, did a lot of work with it in Romania. Did a lot of work with it here. He'd get angry. He'd get frustrated over his apathy. So anger would come up. And then he'd go back to apathy, back to anger, back to apathy, back to anger. This battle <laughs> you know, until eventually he started to get a beautiful smile and started to get over it just like he's got now. And he started to just learn, learn to laugh at himself and have a good time. And the apathy wasn't such a big deal anymore. And then he started to get good at getting out of it. Like when he got into it, he started to recognize it and understand it and see the mechanism. And then he started to say, okay, how do I climb out? Boom, how do I climb out? Until eventually he started staying out more than in. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce Anthony and, uh, and I'm gonna let him tell you his apathy story. Um, and uh, we, had, we had a few apathy nicknames for you too, didn't, too, didn't we? Yeah, Stony. Stony was the big Stony. One. <laughs> <He's dropping laughs> stone, okay? Not stone at all, but his eyes are stone. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> okay. Cool, man. So, uh, what's going on, guys? Uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous for this particular talk because, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, apathy is crazy. Apathy is like interwoven into a lot of my past, uh, a lot of um, my upbringing. Uh, like, uh, I'll give you an example, um, you know, my, had a mother who was on drugs for a very long time, and I remember, uh, especially around the age of 10-ish, around that age, uh, just being always in an argument with her. She was very confrontational all the time, and I think she was just on edge a lot, especially coming down from her drug use, and uh, I remember just always being super angry at her, and, um, but also feeling a lot of guilt and a lot of shame for being angry at her. Uh, cause up until that point, I never, ever really argued with my mom up until that point. It was just kind of, uh, it was a lot different, but, uh, even going back before that, uh, you know, I used to get whooped a lot as a kid. I used to, uh, <laughs> a lot, a lot of, a lot of discipline in my, in my family, a lot of discipline in my family. A lot of things happened, a lot of, um, moving around as kids, 
uh, moving into new places, new cities. Um, you know, so kind of thinking back, I feel like the, the apathy could have started to have settled in anywhere in any of those particular moments. When I specifically remember being in the most apathy as a kid, when I really actually started to look back in hindsight and see, it was probably around the age of 12. And I remember around that age, um, living with my uh living with, living with my aunt because my mom had gone into uh rehab for a drug addiction and um i remember living with my aunts and just this overwhelming feeling of not being wanted there especially by my cousins um and i remember that uh things here from crackling yeah hopefully it's not too bad um okay. yeah i was typing I mute myself okay um what I specifically remember then was just always having this feeling of boredom. Like it was constant, always boredom, um, tiredness, taking naps all the time for no reason. Like it was summertime and I'm just taking naps all the time. And, uh, you know, I, my aunt was very uh, active and she would always try to get me to do things, you know, let's go to the library, let's go do this, and let's go do that. And uh, I was just always tired and I would always avoid doing those things. Um, so, Obviously, at the time I was younger, I didn't know that that's what apathy was or or even what apathy was. You know, you just kind of living at that age, you don't know what's going on. Nobody nobody really knows it either. So um, kind of brings me to where we are now, which is as an adult, when did I start to understand what apathy was? And <laughs> hang on a second, I'm saying the curse laptop strikes again. Uh, not the same crackling, maybe. Okay. okay. Just see, uh, I don't know how to fix this. Let me try taking my headphones off, see if I can just use my computer mic. Let's see. Okay. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's good. All right, cool. Awesome, man. Okay. That is so much better, Anthony. That's way better. This was having issues earlier, and I actually, for some reason, likes to chop out. So if it chops off again, then, uh, just have to figure it out. But anyways, uh, I don't know how much of it you guys missed, but I was just gonna give you a speed through. You know, had a had a mother who was addicted to drugs. Um, you know, went to live with my aunt. My mom was in the drug rehab. I remember being in that household. It kind of happened just like a lot of opposition from the, the cousins in the household for them not wanting me there. And it was kind of weird. And I remember kind of that being the start of me taking these naps during the day all the time and just being feeling energetically drained. Um, and up until that point, I never remembered experiencing that. And, um, and ever since then, it never, it never really stopped. And so it wasn't until when I really took um, the Bucharest week-long workshop, the second one, the second one, that's when it really started to uh, show itself. And I remember Brian really pointing that out most of that workshop that apathy was showing up. And, um, I still had a very, a very vague understanding of what it meant because he could see it very clearly, right? He's dealt with it a lot more. And me, I was just like, we call it here a fit, being a fish in water. Like I didn't know that it was something, you know, like I was just used to being tired all the time. I thought I was just being tired and then I was tired. And so, um, you know, when it started to become brung to my awareness that it was apathy and what it was, it started to become this thing I couldn't unsee at that point. And when it starts to become a thing you can't unsee, you start to see how it's woven into every area of your life, especially in mine and every area of my thinking. Um, so a lot of that workshop, that whole, I would say seven days, six or seven days, I spent in apathy. And I remember leaving that workshop thinking, fuck, I didn't get as much as I wanted out of it. And I was very much judging the apathy for not letting me get what I wanted out of it. Um, but looking back in hindsight on it now, I can't be more grateful for that particular workshop because had it not been brought to my awareness, there's no telling what I would be right now. Um, so apathy, um, kind of trying to see where I want to take this thing. Um, so the, the minute I started to kind of really understand the apathy and it took months, it literally took months. I can see Brian frustrated with me sometimes <laughs> when I was in apathy because I still didn't know. I still didn't know when it when it was coming on. I didn't know what was causing it. Never. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had no idea what was causing it. I had no idea 100% what it was. But I just know that I was being poked at and Brian's like, this is happening, this is happening. And I was just like, okay, I don't, I don't get it. And then the minute I started to kind of see glimpses of it, 
all of a sudden this whole this wider vaster understanding of what apathy actually was started to settle in and then instantly i started to be able to see the things that were triggering it because it's, it's it's literally it's literally like an emotional it's, it's an energetic drain on your body and say for a one minute you have energy then all of a sudden something happens and then your energy just dips and dives and then i started to kind of see it i started to see how almost everything was creating that like maybe somebody would say something to me a certain way and I would feel a certain way about it. And instead of being vocal about how I felt about it, I would just shrink down into this hypothetic place that I was so used to being. And it felt like a warm blanket, honestly. And when I would feel that emotion, nine times out of 10, I would want to go home and take a nap. Right. And it was kind of like, um, it was kind of like, it was, it was just something I was in for so long. And I was like, this, this feeling of always wanting to take a nap, it's starting to make sense now. It's starting to make sense. I'm starting to see where it gets triggered at and exactly why I go home and take a nap. And after I take a nap, I usually feel a little more energetic, but then something else will trigger it and then again, I'll get tired again. So this was happening everywhere. This was um this was happening and it was and it was really it was really destroying a lot of the life that I had in me. And I remember specifically coming like really starting to come out of it and what it felt like and it felt very painful to come out of it and i, and I previously heard brian say that when you're coming out of apathy you're going to find yourself going up the emotional scale right and when you're coming out of apathy you're going to start to you're going to start feeling a lot of the emotions that you don't want to feel that are the reasons that you put the reasons that you're putting yourself in apathy in the first place so you guys have seen the um you guys have seen the chart that we did on the racing call where it's like you know apathy, grief, fear, you know, lust, anger, pride, courage, acceptance, peace. So a lot of the coming out of apathy for me was starting to allow myself to feel those really lower, those low feelings, right? Because that's really what was causing apathy in the first place. Somebody would say something to me, this is an example, right? Somebody would say something to me, I feel like shit, maybe I had to go into fear, or I'd go into grief or sadness or something about it because I wasn't standing up for myself or vocalizing anything and I would just shut down. Um, I'd be fearful. I'd be fearful about something, and then I'd go into shame or about being fearful about something, and then I'd go into apathy. I'd be angry about something, but since I'm not vocalizing my anger, or if I even if I did vocalize my anger, I feel shame about having anger, and then I jump back down into apathy. So it was kind of like you're trying to come out of something, but every time you get a little bit up, you just knock yourself back down, knock yourself back up, back down. So a lot of it had to do with understanding that the ins and outs of apathy, right? you know, what's really calling you to go back into it. And a lot of it has to do with the self judgment, the shame, the fear, and then starting to understand how to allow yourself to feel those emotions without beating yourself up and putting and putting yourself back down in that hole. Um, so let's talk about starting to come out of it, right? And for a lot of you guys too, who have apathy and a lot of guys we've seen in our workshop, they're always asking, how do I come out of apathy? How do I come out of apathy? And I'm always telling guys, look, the, the, the biggest part of it is being aware of what's causing it, being aware of the energetic pattern. And then from then from there, you can't unsee it. And then so you have to act in a way that's going to actually have to come out of it. And a way to do that is to start allowing yourself to feel those emotions that you don't want to feel. Um, I actually wrote a little list here of what apathy is. Let's kind of go over this for a second. So, Anthony, can you also make sure you cover? Uh, I think a lot of people got the got that aware that you were you know you used sleep as your form of apathy. There's other forms of apathy too besides sleep. So, are you going to cover that too? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, this 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 list of apathy that I got right here I wrote this morning. I was thinking about it. I was filling stuff out. Okay. So, what I wrote here is it's called it says what is apathy. And what apathy is, is one, it's a shutdown emotionally, right? It's, it's, it's an emotional numbness, okay? It's giving up, essentially. Uh, it's, re it's resignation from life. Like when you really think about that, it's a resignation from life. Like you're literally signing out of doing anything in your life that's gonna make you happy, that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna, give you life that's going to give you feelings that are, that are going to give you emotions because generally you're scared of feeling those emotions 
because once you feel those emotions, for some reason, it's going to, it's going to knock you back down and apathy. Maybe you have shame around feeling those emotions. Maybe you have fear. Maybe you have anger around feeling certain emotions. Um, another, another apathetic thing is, you know, why try or why bother or what's the point? Right. You're thinking about maybe taking a trip somewhere or you're thinking about starting a business or you're thinking about doing something that's that you've been wanting to do. But then you have this thought in the back of your head. It's kind of like, you know, why bother? I can't do it. Um, that's a really huge one when it comes to keeping yourself in apathy. Um, another one is I don't know or confusion. You know, when somebody asks you something, so, so what, do you, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. All right, it's kind of like that. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. And that's apathy too, right? The confusion about something is apathy. So it's it's almost like it's almost like a game that your your ego plays or your subconscious plays in order to remain safe, right? And so these answers are really kind of they're they're stopping you from a, they're stopping you and they're helping you avoid going any deeper. It's actually thinking about these things because once you actually think about these things, what do you want to do with your life? There's a part of you that doesn't really believe you're going to achieve this anyway. So that's a part of the protective mechanism of it. Another part of it is feeling emotionally heavy, right? Just feeling drained of energy, uh, almost lethargic in a way. Uh, negative thinking, right? Uh, another huge one is I can't. I can't, right? I can't is a huge one, man. The, the minute that you start to have a thought about doing something, maybe doing something creative, maybe it could be literally anything. And then that little voice comes in the back of your head, I can't do this, or there's a feeling that I can't do this, that'll keep you in, that'll keep you in apathy, right? Because the truth of the matter is, it's not that you can't, it's that you won't, right? Or it's that you don't know how, all right? And as you start to kind of come out of the apathy, going into maybe grief or start to go into maybe fear, the thoughts around that kind of stuff starts to change. It starts to be like, instead of I can't, it starts to be like, I just don't, I don't know how I need help. So it's a different it's an energetic change, right? Um, another part of uh, apathy is tiredness that I was talking about, right? Constant napping um, or feeling of helplessness. Um, feeling energetically depleted. Another one of uh, victimhood. That's an, another huge part of apathy, uh, you know, blaming others for feeling the way you feel or for not being where you want to be in life. Um, that's a really huge one. You know, another one is I can't feel anything. I'm numb. I don't feel my emotions. I don't know what I feel right now. That's numbness. That's apathy. That's nothingness. Um, and last one I got written here is a, is avoidance. That's a huge thing, right? We avoid the things that we actually want to do because we don't feel like we can actually do them or we're too scared to look at them because looking at them and actually going towards them actually causes us pain and that pain is going to put that pain is probably too much too much to take on and it's going to put us back in apathy which brings me to the other point here which is apathy being an overwhelm of emotions right an overwhelm of feeling emotions that you feel like you can't handle which is why your body shuts down in the first place right so if you're overwhelmed with emotions let's say you've got a lot of a lot of the act like emotions, a lot of the grief, a lot of the fear, a lot of the, um, the lust. Yeah, lust is another huge one, and anger and some nice pride. There's overwhelm of those feelings and you're not comfortable with them. Your body's gonna go into apathy to keep you safe from having to feel those emotions. Um, am I on point here, Brian? Or do you feel like you need to interject with anything? Because you're saying something about the other ways that you can feel Apathy. I think you're, you're doing a great job because not everybody that gets apathy is necessarily falls asleep. Some of them just completely numb out. They, they have no sense of emotion. I had an old roommate that was really apathetic. Um, great guy, but he was, he just couldn't feel an emotion. He was, but he was very driven, focused, tons of energy, but to him, life didn't have any color. And uh, when I first went over to his place before I, he moved in with me, it completely reflected. It was so gray, so drab. It was like a cave. And he couldn't understand why people would want to put color up, you know, because he couldn't relate to emotion. The other thing I'll say about apathy that I think is really important is it's not the lack of emotion, although it seems like that. It's the, um, it's the overload of emotion. So if you got a, it's like the emotion, like if you got a hose and it's flowing, and we talk about this all the time, just flowing, 
that's feeling. Everything's flowing and the hose is guiding the, the water, which is represents the emotion, or the riverbanks are guiding the river and the water represents feeling and emotion. And the riverbanks are massaging the river, uh, the water, uh, the water's massaging the riverbanks just as much as the riverbanks are guiding the water. And, they, and they, they have a symbiotic relationship. They're forming each other over time. And with apathy, what happens is like a dammed up river or a closed off hose. It's, it becomes so pressurized. There's so much pushing at once. All your thoughts start to pick up. And, all, and then eventually you can't handle all that thinking and all that rushing. You just start to numb it all out and put it in the background. And so that's more of an overload of feeling to the point of shutdown. Like the circuit breaker, too much electricity and the circuit breaker popped. And now I can't feel. And now I just numb out to it, put it in the background, suppress it. And then when we start to go look at it, like Pandora's box, we want to unlock the lock and look at what's inside. And they always say, don't open Pandora's box unless you're ready to deal with what's in there because you can't close it. And so we want to go look at it. And as we start to move in that direction to do work, what do we do? Oh, or distract, or, you know what? I'm going to go watch Netflix. Oh, I'm going to go stare at my phone for an hour. And then two hours goes by and you haven't done any of the work you said you were going to do. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a sign of stuff like that. So uh, that's it, man. I'll let you take it over. Can, can you talk also about the difference between apathy and grief? Because they're right next to each other. It's apathy, grief, fear, and how they, how they play off each other. But continue with your talk. You're doing great. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll, jump to, I'll jump to that as I go along. So check this out. I got another section here, and it's called how, how, is apathy, I'm sorry, how is apathy affecting your life? And I'll jump into the grief and apathy part of it in a second. But um, so apathy stops you from feeling the full range of, of emotions, right? So kind of like Brian was talking about a second ago, right? Ha actually having color in your life, like actually seeing that life is so so beautiful, and it's not like this this I don't know what's the word for it, this black and white or this just this gray this gray thing, right? And when you're in apathy, you don't feel that because it's constantly you're essentially you're running from emotions that can make your life a lot more colorful. So when I'm, when I'm, as I'm coming out of this apathy, cause I'm having complete come out of it, but I got, I got a lot of it out. <laughs> and as I'm getting out more and more and more, I'm starting to see the stories that come up around the apathy in the first place. Uh, the first thing I started to notice is as I started to come out, the, out of apathy was the grief, the fear, the lusting and the wanting and having to learn how to be okay with having those emotions and residing in those emotional states for a period of time so I don't knock myself back down to apathy. Because again, apathy, what is it? It's really the resistance of allowing yourself to feel certain emotions that you don't want to feel. And the minute that you start to feel okay, feeling the grief, feeling the fear, feeling the lust or anger, all of a sudden you don't need apathy anymore. Apathy starts to leave on its own because you feel okay in these lower emotions now these emotions obviously don't say you were only guys on a releasing call last time and you can release out of those emotions more and more but again the the key here is that you have to allow yourself to feel those emotions you have to allow yourself to be in those emotional states and come into acceptance of them before you can fully start to let go of the apathy um but I have, also what I have here is uh, by blocking your lower emotions, you block the higher emotions, okay? So if you like, in order for your life to start to become more, more colorful, more powerful, more impactful, for you to start to do the things that you actually love and want to do, you got to come out of the apathy, right? In order to do that, again, you have to go through some of those heavier emotions if that's really what's keeping you in apathy. And it's a good chance that, that it is. So the minute you start to allow yourself to go through those heavier emotions, the emotions transform into the lighter emotions, right? A lot of people don't understand what that means or how that happens. Like if you spend a certain amount of time in feeling grief, exploring grief, allowing yourself to have grief without having the judgment on grief or having shame about feeling grief, you start to not need the grief anymore. Like the grief tends to stop serving its purpose. It doesn't have a purpose anymore. And then as a result, you naturally shoot up the emotional scale. So, a good way to do a good way to really start to check with yourself is kind of see what's on the other side of the apathy that you're avoiding feeling and start to feel more of that until you can allow it to burn off and rise and just transform into the higher emotions. Okay. Um, how is apathy affecting your life? You're giving up before you've even started. All right. Think of, think of a goal that you have. Think of 
but I don't know. You know, you want to start your own company or you want to travel, for instance, right? And then the first thing that comes into mind is, oh, I don't have the money for it. I can't. I can't do that. I don't have the time. Right? All these excuses that you make in order to satisfy the apathy and to keep you there, right? It's an egoic thing. So again, that's apathy making your life very grayscale because you're keeping yourself in this box that's not letting you get out and enjoy any other color. And as long as you stay in there, it's going to continue to happen. Okay. Uh, apathy. That's how is it? How is apathy affecting your life? What's well, causing you to play small, right? As a result of you not taking the risk and going for what it is you want in life, you stay small, right? You stay in that box. You stay in this place of comfort. And I always, I always say it's akin to like a warm blanket of emotions, a warm blanket, a nice nap. That's what it feels like. Cause because you, if you're used to being in it, it's a very comforting place for you. You always go there. And so you kind of got to step out of it and go out to your, into your, into the discomfort and come out of your comfort zone. Um, it's really amazing when you start to do that. Okay. Again, how is that the effect in your life? Well, stopping you from finding and seeing solutions out. And it's stopping you from finding solutions and seeing solutions to the things that you actually want to do in life. So when you say, I don't have the money, and then you stop there, you completely just cut yourself off from any possibility that you can find the money or the money's going to show up for you. And you start to notice that when you come out of apathy, all of a sudden, all these possibilities are just around you. And it's not that they haven't been around you, it's just that you haven't been seeing them because you're apathetic thinking. Okay. Um, You've had so many great stories about coming out of apathy and then taking more risk and how that really just changes your life completely. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Uh, what's our time anyway? Okay, cool. 30 minutes in. All right. Um, how's apathy affecting your life? It's kind of like Brian was saying, you know, you don't see things through, right? You hit a place of discomfort and something that it is you want to do along the path, along the journey, along the plan that you have written down towards going where you want to go. And then you give up and then you don't follow through. And then you have a bunch of these undone plans that you haven't completed for years that have gone by. So very vital that you get out of apathy. Okay. How the that? thing I found in apathy, the littlest thing can be work. Like just getting up and cleaning up your room. Oh, it's so much work. Doing the dishes, so much work. And you tend to just let these messes pile up. Consistency goes to shit in apathy. If any of you have ever read what, um, uh, it's a slight edge, which I recommend all the time. It's all a book about consistency and compounding interest, which is the key to success. And apathy, what's consistently what's consistency like, Anthony? An apathy. Talk about consistency and self-trust. Those are the two key things that apathy just destroys, and they're the two major key things to all success. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's yeah, you get the negative, you get the negative consistency on both of those, actually. <laughs> you don't get the positive consistency on it. You, be, you very, very, very much become the person who's non-consistent. You're very consistent at being not consistent. <laughs> so you compound into the negative. You guys heard Brian talk about the, uh, you know, the, the compound interest chart about going up. You can actually literally go down, right? You're doing the same thing every day. You're not completing tasks. You're not building self-trust because you say you'll do something, but you don't do it. And then all of a sudden, you build up this mentality where it's just like you don't even trust yourself to say that you're going to do something because you know your pattern has been to not do it. And that kills self-trust right there. And that keeps you, and again, that keeps you in apathy. It's like apathy is, I don't know, man. It's like quicksand and it, it keeps you in there. And it, once, you, once you're in there, you just keep cycling in it more and more and more and more and more. Uh, so you got to take whatever steps you can to get out. Um, another, another apathetic thought is everybody else can, but I, I can't. That's a huge one. You start seeing people on uh, Instagram, for instance, and they're living all these fabulous lives. Even though we know Instagram is a little bit inflated, you start to see that, and then you start to feel like ah, everybody can do all this stuff, but I can't, and it just throws you deeper into that apathy. Um, and the last one I have on this list is apathy. It blocks courageous actions. Like, it literally blocks courageous actions. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you don't take risks. You don't go for things you want. You, you're not really opening yourself up to helping people. Like say, for instance, if we saw a homeless person who needed help on the street, you probably wouldn't do it. There's a part of you that's just like, ah, uh, uh, you know what I mean? That, that whole thing, that's apathy again. It's not allowing you to live your fullest life and it's, and it's really crippling. And I've heard, I've heard this thing, I heard this thing before, I heard this, uh, I've seen it in memes. 
it says uh, fear has killed more dreams than failure ever has. And I feel like apathy is probably even worse than the fear. Apathy has killed more dreams than anything, <laughs> right? Because it kills the dream before you can even actually conceive it or really even think into it. So um, with that seeking for you guys who are going through apathy, um, this last bit I have here is it's called how to overcome apathy. And I've said it a lot going through this, through this talk already. Um, the number one thing that stands out to me when it comes to overcoming apathy is learn how to be aware of it, right? Become aware of your apathetic thinking. I'm curious, did you hit on the self-trust part? Like developing self-trust? Uh, I did very low. Okay. Um, do you mind if I hit on it really quick? I want to yeah. want to add that piece in because it's so important. I want to create a whole program on self-trust, guys, because it's a it's a path out of apathy. Self-trust is this idea that what I say I'm going to follow through with, and and from self-trust come trust come consistency. And so as you start to develop more and more self-trust, first with little things, you get more and more consistent and more and more consistent. And so when you realize the importance of self-trust, you're going to work your ass off to learn learn to trust yourself. That my word is law that what i say i'm going to do i follow through at least to a level of fruition i commit to a certain that I'm, I'm going to commit to a goal for the next week three days a month i'm going to complete it so that i have that pattern in my subconscious mind of success so when you're really apathetic you start with little things and you build your way up one of the biggest reasons people don't take programs with us or programs with other people or programs that will change their life or take the, get the college degree they've always wanted or the education they always wanted is they don't think they'll follow through they don't trust themselves I really want to be a lawyer, but what's the point? I just fail anyways. I'll quit halfway through and spend all that money. That is a life destroyer. And I want to create a program that helps to cultivate self-trust in people and pull people out of apathy, grief, and fear, which is what stops self-trust ultimately. So I wanted to, do you want to add more to that, Anthony? No, I think you know it. <laughs> that's great. It's, that's something I'm currently learning right now as we, uh, as we are in our own, uh, our own uh, container program with the coaches. And, you know, that's, it's, super fascinating how when you start to allow yourself to do the things that you say you're going to do how much more stronger you become and solid in making goals in the future for yourself because you know that you'll you'll handle it whether whether it's you succeed at it or not you'll still keep going towards it and you won't give up and it's, it's very powerful so to trust yourself uh so back to how to overcome the apathy um dealing dealing with the pain that arises and uh, you know, I know they can sound like a turn off emotionally because a lot of people don't want to feel the pain, right? And a lot of people don't know how much pain is in there. Maybe it's a little bit, maybe it's a lot. Um, the key there is to not dramatize the pain. I'd say is the biggest thing there or overthink the pain because the minute you start to think about how much pain you might have to deal with on the other side of the apathy, you kind of automatically turn yourself off to allowing yourself to deal with it. And a lot of the times it's not as bad as you think it's going to be a lot of it's just the thoughts about the pain that are really creating that want not to step into it. Uh, so really start to think about that. Um, another one is be very vigilant about letting go of the apathetic thoughts. I wouldn't even say think, I wouldn't even say I wouldn't even say letting letting them go. I honestly just say be very vigilant about being aware of them when they come up because um, they're clear indications of what emotional state that you're in. Your thinking always follows your emotional states your emotional states produce the type of thoughts that you have. Um, especially when I, when I came out of the second Bucharest workshop and I really started to understand, say, start to get a grasp or start to really listen to what Brian was saying about apathy. That's when I said, I said earlier, I can unsee it at that point. And the minute I can unsee it, I was just catching it all the time. And it was like, eh, that's apathetic thought, that's apathy, that's apathy. The more I dug into it over the months, everything just got a lot more clear. And I can literally catch myself thinking these apathetic thoughts and just tell myself, okay, cool. I'm just going to sit with the emotion right now until it decides to leave and break up. And the minute that the apathy will start to break up, you come on the other side of that and it's like, okay, yeah, I can do this. I can see myself doing this. This is, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a little challenging, but I can do it. Um, and I think that's part of the, uh, you know, what Brian was saying earlier about the, the grief and, the, and the, the fear emotions versus the apathetic emotions where it's just like, I can't. And maybe having some fear emotions might be like, yeah, I'm a little scared to do this, but I feel like I can do it. And I kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm up for the challenge. That's a whole different type of thinking, but it's coming from a whole different emotional state. So you start to notice as you rise out of the apathy and you come into these other emotional states that your thinking starts to change very slightly, but it starts to change from a place of no, I can't, what's the point into maybe, 
and then it gets a little higher and it's like, okay, yeah, I can kind of do this. And then you go a little bit higher and it's like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely want to do this. And then you go, you're up into pride and maybe anger. Then it's like, yeah, let's fucking just do this. Let's get this done. And then peace, courage, acceptance, obviously it's more effortless. Okay. So uh, be very vigilant when it comes to scoping out those thoughts when they come up. Um, next one I have on here is that it has to become a daily practice until you begin doing it without effort. Right. At first, it's going to be a little difficult when you're fishing water. You don't know that you're fishing in water. You don't even know that you're in water. Right. You don't know that the, the water is the apathy. You're just in it and you've been in it for so long. So it's got to become a, literally a daily practice. And in no time, what's going to happen is you just start doing it automatically. You'll start catching yourself having these silly thoughts about I can't do this. And it'll be like the most simplest things like Brian was saying, like getting out of your bed and making your, and making your bed every morning. You know, like you start catching that stuff right away and then start to sit with it and release on it or allow the feelings to be there until it starts to dissipate. And then notice how quickly that, sh that thinking shifts. All of a sudden, it's like 10 minutes ago, you're like, I can't. 10 minutes after, you're just like, okay, yeah, I can kind of do this. I can start. I can get up. I can move this, these clothes into the laundry. I can start to kind of, you know, spread the sheets on the bed. And as you keep going up the scale, you start to do it a lot easier, a lot more effortless. Um, and that's with any and everything that you decide to do. It's not just making your room. It's it's also, I'm going to go out and approach women today, or I'm going to approach girls today. I'm going to go out and I'm going to uh, create a plan for my business that I want to start. I want to make a certain amount of money and I'm going to start to work towards it now. Those same things, apathetic thoughts, catch them, start to watch the thoughts shift and then start to release on even on all those lower emotions, all the, the grief, the fear, and all this stuff start to rise with the emotional scale in regards to whatever your goal is. Um, another one, catch your apathetic tendencies. So it's one thing to catch your thoughts, but then it's another thing to catch the actions, right? That are, are the thoughts that are driving the actions. And the actions are like, are like you know, napping, uh, stuffing your emotions down with Instagram, Pinterest, COVID-19 videos, you know, fear, stuff like that, uh, eating obsessively, video games, overthinking is a huge one, sitting around and overthinking your problems. Daydreaming is another one of them. Um, being, in, being in desire and lust is another one. Um, desire and lust could easily put you back down to apathy if you have, if you have a lot of desire and lust or want for something and you feel like you can't obtain it and you go back down to apathy because there's a lot of pain associated with the wants that you have and the belief that you can't obtain it. So start catching those tendencies again and start to allow yourself to come up out of them into the, the higher emotional states. Again, grief is a higher emotional state than apathy. Fear is a higher emotional state than apathy. So is uh, pride, lust, anger, okay? Um, Another one here, start facing your apathetic triggers, All right? And this, was, this was a really huge one for me because the minute I started to catch on to, okay, when somebody says this, my body does this, energetically just drains, and then I want to go take a nap or I get tired, which like Brian was saying earlier, that's my thing. My go-to thing is I get tired when I'm in apathy for some reason. Yeah. And I can go from 100% energetic to just like that in a, in a matter of seconds. So start facing your triggers, start to realize what your triggers are. And common triggers with apathy are shame, shameful thinking, placing shame on yourself, um, being shameful for who you are, things that you've done, things that you said. You know, another one is like uh, having, uh, having guilt. Guilt can put you into apathy, right? If you're judging yourself too harshly, um, being able to catch it when it comes up, you know, a great way to do that is to start releasing on the guilt, releasing on the shame emotions so that they don't affect you in this way where it sucks you back down. Um, take the wrong and write off the shame and the guilt and, and I guess have to experience it and let it die off and let it burn off. That's the best way to do it instead of succumbing to the guilt and the shame. Uh, anger is another one because anger in general, especially if you have nice guy tendencies, anger could immediately knock you into shame about having your anger or about expressing your anger to somebody and then slide right back into uh, apathy because the shame is so heavy, the shame is so thick. Uh, another one, self-judgment, right? And I feel like self-judgment is really the seasoning on top of all of this, all of these triggers anyway, 
right? Jane, shame is self-judgment. Guilt is self-judgment. You have anger about, you have shame about the anger, which is self-judgment. Uh, learn to stop judging. Stop judging the emotions. Learn to catch yourself when you're judging the emotions and judging yourself for feeling those emotions and just have the emotions judge free, judge free. free. Um, rejection is another one, another trigger. So if you're going out and you're meeting women and you're getting shot down left and right, stop letting those rejections put you in apathy. Right? Sit with the rejection, feel it, feel what you're feeling, feel what the underlying emotion of the, the rejection feels like. You know, maybe I feel like crap, I don't feel good enough, I feel like you know, feel less than, sit with that stuff, sit with the underlying emotion under that too until it all starts to clear up and get a lot lighter and it will get lighter. Okay? It will allow yourself to run through it because if you don't and you just keep doing it while you're feeling all these emotions, it's going to continue to hammer you down back in the apathy. Okay? So try to catch yourself. Um, let's see what I got here. Uh, another one which I like is allow yourself permission to take a risk and get messy and make mistakes. Okay, that's it. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Allow yourself to mess up. Allow yourself to put yourself in positions where you would normally shame yourself without the shame there. Right? Go out and take steps and allow people to see you failing. It's okay. Right? But don't just jump into this judgment of yourself. That's going to knock you back down to apathy. Okay? Um, again, this goes without saying, feel everything. Okay? Allow yourself to feel everything that's coming in. And even if you can only feel a small percentage of it, allow yourself to feel what you can take on. Okay. Don't try to take on everything if you can't, if it's going to knock you back down, it's apathy. Allow yourself to feel it in increments and in pieces until that breaks off and you can find yourself being able to deal with the larger chunk of whatever the emotion or thought pattern is or the emotional pattern or whatever the trigger is. Okay. Um, and Brian gave me this one. This was an awesome one because whenever we would go out and do work, I was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I would be apathetic. All right, we'd go out and we'd do some approaching and I'd be very apathetic. And he would tell me, he'd say, look, man, you gotta, you can't be doing this when you're feeling apathetic because your energy starts to wear everybody out. And it's, it was true. It was knocking everybody out around us, around where everybody was in exercises. So he was like, do this, um, take a second, sit down and start to become very present in your environment and start to listen, take in the sounds of your environment, right? Listen to the birds chirping, listen to the trees, listen to the wind become really present in your environment, touch things, right? Start to feel things physically, put your hand out and touch some wood or touch your wall. Let all the sensations run through your body because what it does is it starts to, it starts to break up the apathy in a way that it, it allows you to start feeling more stuff, feeling more outward than going inward and being in apathy. Um, you know, go step into some really cold water, for instance, and let that, let that feeling run through your body to wake your body back up. Um, he gives a really good charge. Uh, so taking all the bodily sensations is what I mean. Yeah, you're, you're basically there stepping into the tension of the now. There's tension in the now and you're getting back and you were numbed out to it and you're getting back in the now and out of the past and the future. And that's what, that's what you got. You can't be in apathy. If you get off, like really into the now, you can't be in apathy. So I love that. Um, Power of Now is a great book. It really illustrates that too. So. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yes, that's pretty much all I got. That's all I got here um, on the topic. I mean, there's so much more to it. Uh, if you guys have questions, definitely uh, be interested in answering those. They have lots of questions, so um, <laughs> so let's just dive into those because there's a, there's a lot of them here, and we can have a lot of fun with them. Um, we got to end today by twelve thirty, so let's get these going. Um, um, I can't really, uh, I don't know what's it. Uh, the, so the first question is from Tommy. Hi, Brian. I'm currently watching your sexual transmutation video. I'm not even sure which video that is. I've recorded so many videos. I can't remember the details of each video anymore. Uh, I've only watched the first 10 minutes. Can you give me a quick advice on learning it? Um, I'm not sure what the it, it part of it that I'm even talking about in the video. So, but with everything, the more you can get into cap while you're learning, the, the, the more you'll remember the emotion causes learning. So uh, it's the best answer I can give you right now. Um, Russell, hi Anthony, thanks for doing this. Can you talk about the difference between the wanting, lusting energy when you are operating from your turn on versus choosing women? I've heard, read, and experienced girls getting turned on by how much I want them, their feminine affecting me. So shouldn't we bring some of that wanting desire energy in terms of the game of, game of sex? Yeah, for sure. 
<clears throat> I don't think I don't think in that in that case wanting is a problem. I think I think needing is the problem there, right? The need 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 to have it, and it and it because what it creates is it creates this it creates this energy in the girl that you're talking to that you need to have her or that you're trying to get something from her. Like it's okay to want something, right? It's okay to see the girl and like, oh, she's really really sexy, and I want that, and and I'm gonna go for it. But the minute that you start to try to take and get, she feels that energy and that energy is very repelling. So what I would do honestly with that energy is I would just kind of sit and I would let that energy build up in my body. That part of me that wants her, the part of me that thinks she's sexy, like I let that energy just run through my body and be like, man, it feels, let it feel really good to you. And so that when you're over there and you're talking to her, all that wanting just translates, it transmits into turn on versus trying to get instead of trying to take from her, you're just enjoying her to the fullest because in your body, you feel really good. And in turn, she might be attracted to how you're coming off enjoying your own body. So start to kind of take that into account and consideration when you're out uh, approaching. Uh, so, so, so should we bring some of the wanting? Okay, yeah, pretty much answered that. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, as long as you're, long as you're not trying to get it or take it, yeah, if you're enjoying your wanting, I think it's great. Uh, you know, and people who make their wanting like they get into wanting, and I and I and they're and they're and it's making them angry and frustrated because they want so bad, and they and they don't deep down inside they don't feel like they can get, they don't deserve her, she's not good enough for me. That's that's where the problem is. If you're enjoying your wanting, it's so easy to move into choice and moving forward, yeah, or to let go if it doesn't work out. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, let's go on to this next one. Um, I don't know. This one is written to me. I want to keep mostly you. Let me, let me say it's a big one. Um, maybe we can have you answer it. Hey, Brian, a follow-up question is the one I asked yesterday about how holding on to positive emotions being just as toxic as holding on to negative emotions. You mentioned that to accomplish a goal or dream, you have to feel it on a consistent basis. You also talked about feeling your heart, pelvis, legs consistently. So how do you do all that without clinging uh, to such feelings. How do you maintain the connection to the necessary feelings without being attached to them? This whole thing about clinging to positive emotions is a huge sticking point because I haven't been to successfully hold, been able to successfully hold on to the positive feelings associated with a goal. My mind takes it as a failure and makes me reluctant to try for anything. Do you want to take this one or do you want me to, or what do you want to do? Uh, you can take but, that one. Um, you're, you're naturally built, uh, you're designed to feel positive about the things you really want to bring into your life. Your body naturally feels joy, appreciation for things you want to bring into your life if you don't have a lot of negative stories between you and the goal. So what you, when you get all the negative stories out, the, the self-esteem issues, the disbelief, you actually naturally will start in like, feeling positive about the idea of meeting a girl because there's no reason you shouldn't meet a girl because you feel really good about yourself. You like yourself. Why wouldn't girls like me? I'm a guy. That's the way it works. So you naturally rise up in those areas. Um, as you have more and more self-esteem issues, resentment, anger, you start to actually, uh, every time you create another issue, you're actually kind of shutting off a part of your body. You're numbing out your stomach where a lot of that personal power is. You're, you're clenching, clenching in the shoulders more. And you start to, because you don't want to feel those areas, you're starting to push off from those areas. But as you reclaim those areas and open up and start to relax, all the good feelings start to return. And then let's say you set a goal. Let's say you're, let's, let's take it to the extreme. Let's say you're one of those guys that lives in cap 90% of the time and you're just running around 90, 95% of the time feeling joy and peace and really appreciative for life. Really, for real, not, not faking it. You set a goal, you'd be shocked at how fast it'll come to you. Not because you had to force yourself to feel good, but because your natural state of being is good. And you're naturally, and as soon as you get an idea, you're naturally fueling it. Wow, what about this? And you get curious about that. And then you start imagining this and your body feels it and gets turned on naturally. You don't have to work to do those things. And because uh, the natural expression of your, uh, of your relationship to yourself, to source energy, whatever you call that, energy, source, the universe, and to giving, all that, all that comes together and then it comes out of you. So, um, that's pretty much it for that one. Did you anything you want to add to it, Anthony? Mm -hmm. okay. Well said. I definitely want to take this next one, though. It's interesting. I want to like the next one. Okay. I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, uh, 
Uh, okay, I go down, sorry. Okay, all the people on these calls mention a lot of working directly with Brian and they are being helped more exclusively. How does Fearless address this with the coaches? Uh, with the coaches, are they giving similar experience to your clients? How would we even know? Brian's experiences and knowledge is superior to what the others I would assume have. Go for it. Yeah, for sure. So I like this question because it's like, <laughs> it's like this. I remember uh, first taking my, my first fearless workshop and obviously you, you know, you show up and you do, you do the stuff with the coaches. And I remember even after the workshop was over, I was constantly just wanting to hang around Brian and, and soak up knowledge. So even after these workshops were over, I would go hang out with them, go get food to eat after the workshops. So what it really came down to, it was me choosing to just be around them as much as I could. Um, you know, so when you, so when you kind of say it in the, in a way that, you know, we've been helped with by Brian exclusively, well, it was because we chose to, you know what I mean? And in this work, when you guys are working with us as our clients under, you know, we've worked on Brian and we have our, obviously our own clients, all this knowledge that we're getting from Brian, we're giving directly to you guys, you know what I mean? And, you know, so it's coming directly down the pipe. Everything that we learn from Brian, we give it to you in our own interpretation of it. And so we were all once clients here. Everybody on this panel here was a client of Brian and have taken all the workshops. So nobody on this panel hasn't done the work. Um, so you're getting the exact experience. Yeah, Brian is definitely superior in his knowledge of it, for sure, for sure, for sure. And he, and he can say things in different ways. But I think all of us on the panel, what we really do is we all offer something a little bit different. We all, we all express his teachings in a way that we understand it. Um, but ultimately, you're getting, you're getting the same teachings, I think. I don't know, what do you have to say about that, Brian? I, I agree, a hundred percent. I mean, I teach all the advanced workshops, so a lot of guys just come into those, that's how they get access to me. I also put out videos constantly with more teachings. Uh, I constantly, I'm constantly improving, so I'm constantly teaching you guys more stuff, and my goal is to make, is to duplicate myself through each one of you, so you can all be out there teaching as good as I, like, maybe some of you are closer to where I'm at now. Maybe some of you are farther away, but if you had studied with me, like you started with me, what, five years ago, Anthony? Yeah. Yeah. Just about. Yep. So five years ago, I, I wasn't at the level I'm at now. Am I? Was I? No, not at all. Yeah. And so I just keep improving and keep improving. And then, so Anthony will, as a, and, and Josh and those guys eventually catch up to me and where I used to be, you know, that's the idea. And we just keep creating. If I don't multiply myself, I can't help a lot of people. And uh, I don't burn myself out trying to take care of everybody. It does, just life doesn't work that way. And uh, a lot of people, and some of these guys might get better at some area than me. They might, they might have a natural talent towards something that I, an idea I put, and they naturally went with it. And boom, they teach it so beautifully. Or they might have a way of communicating, maybe that's different than the way I communicate, that relates to the way you communicate really well. Or, uh, and that's really common too. So you got to kind of, and I, this is why I grew so much. I trust that there's some higher consciousness that's got it all in order and knows what I need is making sure I'm in the right place at the right time. And the happier I get, the more in cap, the more good I feel, the more I'm going to end up in the right place at the right time with the right people. And, uh, and that trust has taken me so far. I expect to grow, whether I'm reading a book or learning from another teacher, it just, it's going to happen. And cause I'm going to make it happen. I take responsibility for that. Even when, if I'm sitting in front of the greatest teacher in the world, if I don't open myself, learn and put the practices to work, doesn't mean shit, you know, or I could be reading the book. I could pro possibly even get more out of reading the book of an amazing teacher than sitting at his feet, depending on timing and energy and where I'm at at that moment too. So that's everything I got to say. Yeah. Well said. Um, right. So this one is from, uh, you, want, you want to read it or you want me to read it? Okay. Hang on a second. I think my computer got muted. I can't hear you. Let's see. Uh, there we go. I'm on now. Okay. Anthony, it resonate uh, a lot with sharing anger, uh, with showing anger, shouting back, shouting me back down. Okay. I resonate a lot with showing anger, uh, shooting me back down into apathy because of guilt. Can you speak more about this and how you found ways to cope with this specifically? Yeah, for sure. Um, the, the one thing that stands out to me right now is learning that your anger is not a bad thing. And 
you learning to express your anger feels uncomfortable because maybe you feel like there's going to be some backlash, there's some retaliation, maybe you feel like you hurt somebody with your anger. And then that really starts that cycle of judging it and making yourself feel guilty about it and going through this whole shame cycle. When you start, you really have to realize that anger itself is a powerful emotion. It's, it's a, again, it's not, it's not good or bad. You know what I mean? It's just one of the cycles of emotion. And it could be good in some ways when you, when you look at it in the sense that, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're using anger to finally stand up for yourself where in areas where you've never stood up for yourself before or that you felt scared to stand up for yourself. So start to maybe have some pride about your anger, right? And see if you can start to let the pride around that anger go and maybe go into acceptance and courage about having your anger. Actually, I wouldn't even say pride, I'd say just maybe just jump straight to courage about being able to have your anger or saying things that you have been scared to say and finally said. I remember, I know you for sure, Jason, were working on your anger and um, we've had some chats about that in the group, in the family group. Um, so if you find yourself being like that back down to apathy with it, then you need to start really looking at all that shame that you have around it and all the judgment that you have around yourself for having anger. Okay. Um, start to become, you know, there's people who have anger, they use their anger, boom, and then they go right back to being a nice person, right? It doesn't mean you're a bad person, it just means you have that 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 intensity about you. Have that intensity about you. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're not using it to go out and hurt people intentionally. Okay. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, can you can you address one thing that I I don't remember you covering this? Tell correct me if I'm wrong, but you covered it kind of with anger. Anger is not a good or bad energy. It actually serves you when you, when your energy is really low. Sometimes it feels really good to be angry, right? Like as long as you don't lose control to it and get reactive to it, you can use it productively, which turns it into courage. So can you talk about that with apathy? Why is apathy? A lot of people think apathy is a bad energy. I have to get rid of it. It's my enemy and. It, that will keep the apathy around more than anything else. Can you talk about why that, why that is and, and how, how apathy is actually can be a good thing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you, when you think about it like this, your body is doing exactly what it was designed to do and it's working perfectly functional, right? Cause if you think about it and you have say, for instance, you have a lot of emotions that you're not comfortable feeling or that you don't feel like you can handle then your body goes into apathy to protect you so that you don't get hurt. Right. Think about how beautiful that is. Your body knows how to protect you. And that's, that's it working hundred percent. Now, sure. You don't need apathy all the time. And that's the, that's the tricky part. That's, that's how you learn how to get out of it. That's why you're learning how to get out of it. Cause you don't want to always be in there, but maybe at some point it was a safe haven for you and that you needed to be in there. Maybe you were, it was a point in your life where that apathy was actually keeping you protected from things you didn't want to feel. Maybe you were getting bullied in school and every day you went to school, you had a little bit of apathy or you went home, you had some apathy around it. Right. So, that you didn't have to feel weak or feel ashamed around whatever it was. Um, so I didn't really look at apathy from that perspective. Um, there was a period of time when I first started to understand apathy that I was doing that because Brian would say it that way too. And I was, I was, I would kind of just start showing gratitude towards the apathy. And I would say, you know, Hey, you know, I understand that you're here trying to help me and I totally appreciate it. Right. And then, and I'd say like, I don't, I don't necessarily need you right now at this moment. And then I start to feel the apathy, thin layer of apathy start to, starts to lift off my body and I can start to feel some other emotions that are coming under it. So again, just like anger, it's not a good or bad emotion. It, it's, it's there to help you in some way and it's serving a purpose. And you wouldn't have any emotion if it wasn't serving a purpose for you in some way or, or you're getting a payoff from it as we call it. So kind of start to look at apathy from that angle. Yeah. Perfect answer, man, I love it. Um, Sean writes, am I an apathy? I know that I need direction, a path, a purpose to move forward, uh, a path, a purpose to move forward with anything, but I don't know what I even want. This is a great question. This feeling has gotten worse while working with fearless and going on the, uh, the consciousness path. I'm getting success, but I am not happy. I'm still floating aimlessly through life. How do you find the next step? Get clear on what you want, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an interesting one, man. I feel I feel like this is a personal thing, but I feel like everybody knows what it is they want to do, or what they have a passion for. I think they're just pure, they're pretty much just scared to look at it head on. Um, I agree. Start to start to find that thing. Maybe it's something that you wanted to do as a child. Maybe there's something you want to do when you're a teenager that you kind of just, you know, swept under the rug because you felt like you had stories around doing it. Maybe at this age, or you know, what people might think of you. 
start to think like that because you know, everybody has an emotional an emotional something something that they want to do in life has an emotional pull on them um, I know for me, like, it's like, you know, oh, dr- the idea of driving, like, music, um, making music, for instance, like that. And I had stories about that, doing it at this age, so I really want to do it. But I know for sure that it has an emotional, emotional pull. I mean, it feels really good when I think about doing it. It's almost, like Brian says, it's, it's, it creates a turn on in you when you think about doing this thing. So find out what it is for you, man. Just really kind of be honest with yourself about it. What, what in life that you could possibly be doing makes you feel turned on for it? And then it wouldn't really be a struggle outside is just getting past your stories about it because when you show up and do it it wouldn't feel like work anyway it just feel like fun yeah and for for me i did have a period of time when i didn't enjoy the stuff that i would most love to do like i would do it anyways because i was driven to do it i did have that period i'm like i'm driven to do this i want to do this stuff why don't i enjoy it and it came to a simple a simple realization self-esteem and self-love um i was too busy trying to get my joy out of the thing i was doing and I wasn't getting joy out of just being alive. I wasn't getting joy out of getting out of bed in the morning. So I started working on my self-esteem and self-love, started feeling worthy of the thing, started learning to open my heart to sitting in front of my, uh, like Frederick here, I love sitting in front of my fire uh, on my couch and I, I'll do a meditation, just open my heart and I'll let my connection to source, God, whatever you want to call it in. Uh, then I'll go out and I'll look at the birds and I'll enjoy the morning. I'll sit and enjoy the morning sun for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing is I'm cultivating this ability to feel joy and then that naturally goes right into my purpose now if you don't feel like you can get your purpose you're not good enough for your purpose you're you're not you don't deserve your purpose um you're not going to create joy around it it's going to feel like work but you're still going to want to do it because you're driven to do your purpose um and then if you go after your purpose you might even get some results if you're really grounded solid motherfucker but your heart's not open you might even get results going after you'll be getting results after results after results but still not happy because you haven't learned to open your heart and, and love and care you haven't brought the light part of yourself on online yet so that's the piece i'll add to it um great stuff do you want to say anything about that uh no not think to cover my points of it i like the way you said that awesome uh daniel Hey, Daniel, what's up, buddy? Um, is it part of apathy when you constantly lose interest in a woman after a short time, sometimes a couple of days, not feeling sexually attracted to her anymore, even though you were super excited in the beginning, constantly wanting to change, uh, what, constantly wanting to change women is basically this question. Mm. <laughs> that's an interesting one. <laughs> I don't think there's one answer to that question. So that's my my answer. I, I think it really depends on him, on what he's going through. That's like a question where I'd want to ask him a bunch of questions to find out where he's at, what's going on, what's his stories, you know, because um, there could be a few different things going on there. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. The first thing I was going to say, you know, all this excitement and everything like that, you know, it's just a part of you trying to, to get And when you actually meet the woman or you're actually with the woman, you actually don't really enjoy her. You know, because you, you find that a lot. Some girls you might be attracted to physically, and then you approach them, and it's like, okay. And then you hang out with them for a period of time, and you actually just end up not liking them. You know, maybe their personalities, they don't, you guys don't match. So it's, it's tough to say. I'll tell you what happened to me. I, was, I started dating a lot of women, and, and I wasn't really into being with any of them for a long time. And I went and did a bunch of self-esteem work and work on myself. And suddenly I started drawing more confident, more interesting, more fascinating women than I'd ever dated before. And suddenly I started to like to be with them. It had a lot to do with my self-esteem and self-love when I first started dating. So I was drawing women that matched how I felt deep down inside about myself. Like I, if I felt I wasn't worthy, uh, then I would draw women that kind of felt the same. And then we'd lose interest in each other. I'd lose interest in them. Um, but wow, when I started doing that work, the whole like women that had self-esteem self-confidence that believe themselves start showing up more and more and more and they were much more interesting um so i I often think that that you know you're trying to get there's some part of you that might be wanting validation so you need another girl all the time to get validation once you've got one you don't want to be with her or you pick girls that you you really wouldn't want to be serious with because those are the ones you know you can get and you don't want to deal with a girl that will really challenge you that you could like because that that might get you stuck in a relationship maybe you're scared to be in one so there's a lot of possibilities here man uh, so you got to really explore that um so that was daniel uh where were we at daniel uh tomer 
Uh, hey, Anthony, sometimes I feel light in my body, feel the energy, but my head is very tense, no energy. And when I try to relax, it won't work. I, I guess that's apathy in my head. Any tips to dealing with that? Go for it, Anthony. That's an interesting question. And um, see, well, my head is very tense. I'm like a tight, like I'm assuming like a pressure in your head. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have an answer to that one. I'll ask you, Brian. Um, I would do a lot of meditation and movement work on your sixth chakra or your or your head in general, your your frontal lobe, just like real practice. Uh, and I would give it a week at least and just see what happens and do the front and the back. You're probably just doing the front. What I see with a lot of students is they push their energy forward in the front and they get in the front of their head and then they, they and it stresses them out after they do it all day because they're trying to get stuff done. They're trying to make stuff happen. So if I do it to Anthony right now and I'm looking at Anthony on the screen, let me make your, your picture bigger, Anthony. Hold on one sec. I'm going to pin you. You are, you are now pinned. Um, so if I'm looking at Anthony and I get real intense, I'm like, hey, buddy, what's up? How you doing? Um, how's your day going, man? And, and we go through life like this, like car salesman. Hey, what's up, man? And what will happen is all my energy is getting centered right here and I'm going to start stressing out. And then other people, like, uh, like I had a relative who used to keep her energy in the back. She didn't have much in the front, so she'd be way back all the time in the back of her head, pull back, 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 back. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? What's your name? Where, where are you from? And you can feel the pull away in that energy. And what I, what we have to do is learn to sit in your back while feeling the front open and express because the front's the expression, and especially right here. So you want to meditate and learn to balance these energies. And then as soon as you start to sit in your spine, relax down your back. And this is all the movement and embodiment work we do. And I start to say, Hey, Anthony, what's up, man? How's your day going? You having a good day? And th there's a different energy because now I'm sitting here, letting all this relax all the tension that was here starts to go away and so what i would do is is meditate and release welcome and release all the feelings in the back for for an hour and then the front or 20 minutes 15 whatever you can do and then and kind of go back and forth between the two and so you start to build a relationship that's my guess now if i met you i might say something different because i'm not seeing you uh personally but uh that's my best guess right now uh that that's that that make you think of anything else anthony no yeah, when you were doing it actually i could actually feel you pushing it feels like it feels like you're in my space even though you're on a computer <laughs> all this stuff comes through the computer man it's pretty amazing um uh it, it's 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 crazy i used to do a lot of hypnosis and then releasing sessions on the computer and everybody feels everything sometimes even more so it's like crazy so um uh, uh, this can you put a time frame on how long it took you to go from being stuck in apathy to living in courage? Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna tell you this: the bulk of that time was from the time I left Bucharest to, to probably like three or four months after, because I didn't fully understand it, and uh, <laughs> I was confused about a lot of it. I was confused for like four months about it, um, but also it was me. I wasn't asking the right questions. I didn't know. And so I kind of get myself stuck in that and it doesn't need to take four months. It doesn't need to take that long. Um, you can start feeling trickles of it here and there, but start to kind of really, I would say, pick an area that you want to work on the apathy in and start to focus on specifically cleaning up the apathy in that area. So maybe it's money, maybe it's approaching, maybe it's uh, just the idea of feeling more happy and feeling more free in your body. Start to notice how much apathy you have in that, and then allow yourself to kind of go up the emotional scale, uh, release on whatever's coming up, heaviness that's around it. And the more you, the more you start to see yourself and feel yourself coming from the apathy into courage. Maybe you'll go from apathy, grief, fear, da da da, whatever. It doesn't matter the pattern, but as long as you go from apathy to courage at some point, the more you start to go there, you start to trust that you can go there when that becomes up. So picking one area to do is going to change all the areas. Cause if you can do it while thinking about maybe money, then you can do it when you're thinking about meeting women, same story is going to come up, but you know how effectively how to rise from the apathy to the courage at this point. Okay. So again, it doesn't need to take as long as it took me to do it, but again, you know, I was stubborn. So don't be stubborn. Mm. Yeah, we all, we all have our journey and, and I, I hate to give somebody a time frame, a clear time frame, because then they'll try to, fit their life into that and and everybody's different um hey hey anthony um thanks a lot for sharing i totally relate when you release do you actively try to let go of ag flap feelings or do you accept and love them believing they will naturally go away also 
you personally think cultivating cap feelings uh, is a more efficient way to get out of AgFlap, or would you recommend going up the emotional scale first? So AgFlap stands for apathy, grief, fear, lust, anger, pride, for anybody that's curious, that's the lower emotions. The upper emotions are cap, courage, acceptance, uh, and I'll even add love, as Hawkins puts it, love, peace in there. Yeah, yeah, so a really great question. And the way I'm answering that question is, so do you actually try to let go of it um, feelings or do you accept love, accept and love them, believe in that they naturally go away? It's it's different now. I mean, because it's, it's, I've been doing it for so long at this point. I've embodied a lot of the tools that have been given to us to do it. Right now, currently where I sit, what I do is I just welcome. Welcome. Welcoming is the, the easiest way to do it because like I was talking to Brian yesterday, welcoming is more passive and welcoming feels more like you're just allowing versus trying to release them, which feels like you're actually doing something. So when you're sitting there, you know, feel the emotion, let the emotion come to you and just welcome what it feels like. And what you start to know is that you start to notice is that that emotion that you're feeling or that energy, it'll start to either it'll leave, it'll move a little bit, it'll break up in some shape, form, or fashion, it'll act, it'll dissipate. And then just kind of notice what's behind that and then just keep welcoming that up. So what I do now is just a lot of accepting and welcoming more than trying to let go. Now, um, sometimes you hit a, you might hit a, like a rock of something in there, something that's really solid. And then you can try to let it go. Then maybe you can ask yourself some of the uh, Sedona questions that might help. But um, all of these ways of doing it are just like tools to get the same result, really. So, you know, one day, one tool might work that day, then the next day that same tool might not work the next day. So you might have to switch it up and just do welcoming instead. Or then maybe the next day just do some questions around it. Um, but just kind of find what works for you ultimately is the way to do it. Um, so do you personally think cultivating cap feelings is a more effective way to uh, add flap or would you recommend going of the much scale? Like I said, either way, man, it, it, it just depends. It depends on what's effective for you that day because it's always gonna change. I think developing the cap, the cultivating the cap emotions is a really fun way to do it, honestly. <laughs> because especially when you start reading the list and you start reading the courage, the words on the courage, the words on the acceptance, the words on the peace, and then you start to watch your body light up and it feels really good, then you'll start enjoying doing it that way. But then again, there's gonna be some days you might get to that list and you might just feel like, I, I can't relate to any of these emotions right now. And that's fine too, then just start welcoming. And then go back and forth between the two if you can. And just remember, when you're releasing any of AgFlab, it's to cultivate more cap. Every release cultivates more cap. Everything you do cultivates more cap. Every, every little tiniest release is taking you, is, is moving some energy that's in AgFlab potentially into cap, and that's ultimately what you're doing. So, um, so if, you're, if you have no awareness of cap, yeah, definitely cultivate some cap so that you can, your brain starts to get that. That's the whole point. You, you don't let go. So you just go to not have more cap. You let go to allow that energy to move up towards cap, to move lighter, to get lighter, lighter. You should be constantly moving towards lighter. Now, sometimes you'll get intensifications first before something will let go because you were numbing it out. So as it comes out of apathy, it gets it starts to feel more. There's an intensification, and then it starts letting go. That's okay, too. Um, That's, but, a really hmm? That's a really good point. Allow it to get more intense. Yeah. Because apathy is numbing and then grief is because where it, all the, the sadness, the cr crying, all that intensity starts to come back. So um, here we go. Um, let's see, it's 12, 16. Uh, let's, see, let, let's see if we can start speeding the answers up and do some speed rounds to get these some of these done. Maybe we can get through most of these. Uh, can you overdo it with releasing? I mean, that you release more than your body can process or integrate. Nah, nah, no. <laughs> you, I mean, it's it's allowing, right? And your body can allow. I heard Brian say this before. I'll say it really quickly that like your body's always constantly in a state of trying to release anyway. So you're basically just helping yourself do them, and you can sit down and let these feelings come up. So you can't. Your body can't go into a place where it can't take the emotions. Um, they might get intense, but you can still welcome those emotions up, or welcome however much of that emotion you can. Yeah. yeah, Lester did it 24 hours a day. Hawkins did it 24 hours a day for a while. That's how they woke up. Um, what I would say is simple is um, 
is that if you're doing a lot of releasing and you're getting more in your head and more frustrated, you're probably not releasing. You're probably doing your releases from your head and that's what's causing that. Releasing should actually cause your body to open more. And sometimes we get the, the energy reversed and we start, we go from a letting go process, which is a relaxing from holding this pen. I'm relaxing and relaxing open, relaxing open. And I go to a doing process. I'm going to release this. I'm going to release this as if it's something I'm doing. That's doing it from your head. And you want to um, you, you want to keep training yourself to not do releasing, but to relax into or allow releasing to happen to you. It's something that happens to you, not something you do. <clears throat> um, uh, Andrew, when I'm stepping into tension and releasing, I'll hear thoughts like this isn't working. You're not doing it right. Women aren't going to be attracted to you. And feel this tension in my head. Is, th is that me uh, heading in the right direction? I love yeah. this question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you're not like, letting those questions take you out, that's totally part of the releasing. And those are exactly the, the, the thoughts and feelings you need to start to disattach from as they're coming up. Because you're going to get a lot of them, probably, if you're, if you're in apathy a lot. And uh, don't let that fool you because it's totally trying to trick you <laughs> to stop doing the stop doing the release. And the minute you stop doing the release, and you know it all settles down. But allow yourself to go through that. Once you release on that, you get to the other side of it, and those thoughts won't come up as much anymore. But that's totally the trick. Don't get caught in that. I think that's my favorite question of the day because that's that's it, man. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, uh, Nimrod. Traditionally, when we think of grief. Uh, there's the stages model, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and I probably skipped a few. When you talk about releasing grief, do you mean bypassing the stages? How? Uh, how to work through emotional pain and heal. I feel that grief and pain over my recent hurtful breakup and other things still haunts me and cramps my style when I approach new uh, love interests either uh, scaring them away right off the bat or when uh, we get closer. And then I open up a bit and they hear the pain. Yes, they will. And think, and a lot of girls will say, you're not over your ex, are you? And think I'm either fragile or still hooked on my ex or something and run away. I don't want to have to work on it with a therapist for two years before I can get, uh, get to have sex again. Then, keep, then you got to, yeah, you got to grieve. You, know, you, you haven't grieved yet, enough yet. Um, uh, do you know, how much do you know about the, uh, the traditional stages model, Anthony? Denial, anger, bargaining, all that stuff? No, not much about that. He's talking about the stages of loss. Um, <clears throat> and in therapy, they talk about stages of loss. We, we typically go through specific stages. First, we deny it that she's leaving us, then we get angry, and then, uh, we, you know, that's, that's the basic idea. Uh, the stages are, are there, and basically, you probably will go through all those stages, uh, you could focus on releasing in each of those stages if you want. Um, typically, I just release until everything's processed and I welcome up all the grief. Um, within each of those stages could be a, a whole bunch of ag flap emotions. Take, and you might have to process the ag flap emotions in each stage. You could go into denial and see the anger, the frustration, the grief over losing her, and then boom, pretty soon you're you're, you're, you're in anger and you start to go into anger and you start to process all of that. And then with, as you release in the anger, you'll notice the anger has other emotions attached. You'll feel anger, then a little more grief, a little more anger. Anger is the overriding dominant emotion, but there's other emotions attached to it, like a little storm, like a little cloud with all these little clouds attached to it or a mind map. Um, um, and then uh, depression is, is, uh, is apathy basically. And so, you know, that's, 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 that's the, uh, that's denial itself. They're basically the same thing. So I have to double check that you've got this. Uh, I haven't looked at it in years because I just typically, what I, what I want to do is I don't want to get into a, some type of system that is set in stone because even when you release, you're not releasing an order. You're releasing as, as things come up naturally, what is coming up? Like if I'm drilling into the ground and there's layers of, of dirt, <clears throat> I'm not going to say, I'll go through one layer and I get to the next layer and I'm like, this layer shouldn't be here. It's not the rules. Whatever's there is what I have to deal with. And then the next layer I have to deal with, next layer I have to deal with. Understanding these systems is great for understanding what will probably happen, how it will flow. But if it doesn't happen that way, don't get attached to the system. Be flexible and adjust. Um, so uh, let's, let's check the next. Oh, and getting over his ex-girlfriend. Do you want to talk about that at all? 
uh, it says how to work through the emotional pain and heal. I mean, it's pretty much just what you said in that last one. It pretty much clears it up. You know, you, you got to allow yourself to go through the, the, the grieving of it and um, all that other stuff, but actually clear up on the time, mm-hmm. the anger, the bargaining, because you're going to go through all that stuff as you're starting to dive through the emotions associated with this particular this particular thing and this breakup. Um, all of it's going to arise. Whatever's in there is going to come to the surface. And that's the beautiful part about releasing is that you get to experience all of it and clean it all up as it comes up. So let's keep doing that way. you would be all right. Yeah. So um let's continue on yeah denial is not necessarily depression i said that wrong so that was i was looking at it a little differently um although it could be a form of apathy uh it could be a lot of things i mean you could be in anger and be in denial so um let's continue on yeah you got to work through that grief buddy got to work through. you got to welcome the grief one of a really good question in grief that i ask myself if i ever am attached to somebody and i lose them uh what is this person giving me that i can't give myself and a love of company, uh, company and then what I do is I feel that part of myself that feels like I need to get love outside of myself and then I'll usually if I have a fresh wound like I just broke up with a girl that'll that'll bring on the tears really quick or companionship or feeling good enough and then I just welcome that part of myself that doesn't feel good enough without her like without her I'll never be good enough and then boom and I just let myself cry it all out. And I want to cry. I'm, I'm, if I can let my, if my body wants to cry, I'm going to let it cry all day. And if I can stimulate more crying naturally without turning it into drama, I'm going to do that because that's what's going to help me heal. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not, when I wash dishes, I always uh, leave one spoon dirty. It feels awkward to finish it. It's always the last spoon. Okay, that's not a question, but that's, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> that's Daniel. Hey, buddy. Um, Jay. Brian, a few calls ago, you had this amazing football analogy about reaching the end zone. Uh, yep, I've done that one many times. Before, but before reaching it, most people just go back instead of making that final play toward the end zone. Is this also applicable to Apple? Sure, sure. A lot of times, three feet from gold, man. You're trying to get out of something, and you're about to have a breakthrough. Your whole mind is going to go nuts and try to get you to turn around. You start to go into grief and you start to feel all these emotions out of apathy and you want to cry. And then suddenly I'll see somebody just shut it right back down. How many times have you had, as coaches, how many times have you guys seen that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And experience it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As soon as all the, as soon as all the good stuff is about to come out, it's just like your, your natural tendency is to shut it down and your body does it so smoothly. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, it's, it's, it's like a machine. Boom, this thing's done. Okay, um, so uh, Brian, you said a lack of self-trust is not following through with things. Uh, a lack of self-trust won't let you, will off, will, will, you'll, you probably won't follow through with a lot of things when you don't have self-trust. Because of the self-trust is what you need to follow through. You, my word means I'm going to do this. I want to go to music theater school, and this is already a massive step, but the thought of taking the, any course for uh, three years it feels like such a long time. Three years is such a short time. When you're young, it feels long. Um, each year is a large part of my life, and I don't know if I'd want to keep myself in one place for that long. Therefore, I don't want to start because I don't really feel that I'll finish. Does that sound like it could be apathy? And it could be it could be that it's not your actual burning desire. It could be that it's your burning desire, and you're just making excuses to get out of it. It could be that there's another, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here, but ultimately that happens to everybody. Uh, Everybody, you know, they've got different options and you have to look at them all and find the one that really suits you. And what people who are bad at making, learn about making a decision because people that are bad at making a decision do is they're constantly changing their mind. They make a decision change and they do, and that's their, that's their ego's pattern for getting them out of tension. Oh, I'm, uh, let's, I'm gonna go this way, no, I'm gonna turn around. I'm gonna go this way, I'm gonna, it's because they're afraid of tension, they're afraid of growth, they're afraid of responsibility. Uh, and so since they don't have, and so what it does, it keeps destroying more trust in themselves. And the more trust they destroy, the more they do that behavior, of uh, making decisions quickly and then changing their mind quickly, or making decisions slow. This is the worst, is to make decisions slowly and change your mind quickly, because you don't go anywhere, you end up homeless. Really successful people make decisions and follow it through to a level of fruition that they commit to because they know that on the path from the starting point to the end point of that goal, wherever they're going, that uh, their ego is gonna give them all kinds of reasons to quit. And they don't wanna buy into that. They wanna train themselves that they follow through to fruition. Otherwise they'll do that in every area of life over and over and over again. And then they'll be 55 wondering why their life didn't go anywhere. 65 and they'll be like, Jesus, I did nothing with my life. 
So think about that for a minute. I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an assignment, read the chapter on decision decisions in Napoleon Hill's think and grow rich, read the power of decision. And in there, he's going to talk about really successful people make up their mind quickly and change their mind slowly, if ever at all. And then he's going to talk about the power of decisions in the world and how it's literally formed this whole country in that chapter. And that the willingness to commit to a decision, no matter how difficult it was or how much it scared them, is what formed everything that we have today. So your ability to make a decision is and commit to it is, is everything to do with self-trust, even when it scares you, because it will. Big decisions, especially towards your goal, are going to scare you. You're going to have all kinds of reasons you shouldn't do it. But, you'll have, but deep down inside, there'll be a part of you still calling to do it, like great, something greater than you, bigger than you, telling you to go that way. And you got to learn to trust that voice and then trust yourself that you'll follow through on that voice. Okay. So read that chapter. Um, and then also uh, consider reading the chapter in, uh, it's also a Napoleon Hill book uh, chapter, going the extra mile in, um, in how to, how to raise your own salary. That's, that's the name of the book, how to raise your own salary. Um, okay, cool. Now, do you want to say anything about that? No, no, not at all. Uh, I noticed it's uh, 1228 though. We do have to log off. It's yeah, we're going to log off in a second here. I was watching this. I saw it at 1225. Uh, let's answer this, see if we can get the, if these are easy. Is dissociation a form of apathy or is pure dissociation, this is this, or is pure disconnection from the body? Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to, I, this is a semantics thing, but I want to ask you and niche some questions about what you mean by that. Um, what What is dissociation to you? Uh, so I don't want to totally answer that question. Um, um, because I don't, I'm, I'm trying to picture how you're, how you're picturing it, but yeah, you shouldn't, you should feel all the time, but then you shouldn't be attached to the outcome of the feelings. You should feel everything and not be attached to the outcome. If you're not feeling, then yeah, you're disassociating in some way, shape or form. Um, and then we're going to end on this one. Do you set a goal, what you can control, like water the plants, or do you choose to make one sale, which isn't in your control? What do you think, Anthony? Do you choose to set a goal, what you can't control, like water plants, or do you choose to make one sale, which is in your control? <clears throat> That's interesting. I feel like, um, I don't know why there has to be choice between the two, <laughs> either, either of them. I mean, you know, um, do you set a goal? What's, I mean, what's the goal? Could the goal just be that you get on the phone and you call this person to make a sale? Potentially, then, you know, make that your goal. Um, I like the way Brian says it too, you know, you can create small goals for yourself so they don't, they don't have to be these huge things so that you develop a sense of self-trust by being able to set a small goal, accomplish it, set a small goal, accomplish it, so that later on the big goals are a lot easier to tackle because you kind of already created this consistency with deciding on something and then finishing it, following it through. Um, but, you know, making sales is a beautiful thing, man, so I would definitely go towards that and make that a goal. Yeah, I would say that you you know it, there's a lot of factors here that they can go into this, uh, but in, in in reality you can set them both ways. If it stresses you out a lot to set a goal that you can't control, like I'm going to make a sale today, and I'm not going to leave till I make a sale, and you just get completely down in apathy with that. I bet you can. But if you said I'm going to call, I'm going to make a hundred calls, and you can control that, and that excites you, then set it that way but, but the intention has to still be there to make a sale you still have to have the intention otherwise your brain will at, gladly make 100 calls and not make a sale so ultimately i do set the goal like i'll set a goal to make 100,000 200,000 a year a million a year i'll set a goal to uh it's out to, to to have this this huge business on this corner or to have a beautiful girlfriend i can't control the reaction of those people but i can set the goal but what i can do is release all my attachment to the goal and my aversion to the goal until the good tell I what I'm doing is I'm going to keep focusing and, and releasing on that goal till I'm happy looking at the goal, whether I get it or don't get it. It feels fucking great. Just even focusing on it. And, and then I can feel it more and more in my body until it shows up in my life. That might happen in one day. It might happen in two weeks. Now what I can control that. So that's where my goal would be set. But what I can control is my actions that day that lead toward the goal. So my actions today are going to be make a hundred calls and I'm still going to get that goal. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg set a goal of 100 million subscribers for Facebook. He couldn't control that. But what he could control is all the actions he took that got more subscribers. So he knew that goal was coming. It was going to happen. He, uh, he may not know the exact date. He may have set a date on the goal, but he may not know the exact date. 
he knew he believed it was going to happen. He felt like it was going to happen. And then what he could control was all the things in the actions he took that day, action steps to move towards that goal. Um, you know, whether it's um, whether it's putting in a new feature that causes more people to want to post videos or putting in, you know, something like that. But everything he looked at was filtered through that goal. Will this new feature cause potentially cause more subscribers through excitement, through joy, through whatever? And if they didn't, he threw it out. If they did, they put it in. So is this action going to move me towards the goal of making $100,000 this year, more sales? I got to make X amount of sales per day, per week. Is this action going to move me in that direction? Tomorrow I'll do it again. Tomorrow I'll do it again until I perfect it. So I'm getting the number of sales each day and more than I need to get the goal. And then I'll even perfect that more and I'll raise the goal again. So the goal, so the goal the direction you're going in, the actions are what you can control. Think of it that way. That's, that's probably the way I would most likely do it right now. So there you go, buddy. Um, anything else you want to say there, Anthony, before we close it out? Uh, no, it's been a great call. I've been reading the comments and I'm um, glad I can help. Uh, we got, like I say, if you guys have any questions, I'll put my personal email in there to, uh, you know, let's get in contact. Let's talk about what you guys are going through and how I can help you out of it, man. I'm, I know what it's like to be in there and I know what it's like to be on the other side of it. And I guarantee you guys, it feels great. <laughs> Life feels great on the side of it. So uh, let's chat it up, man. And uh, again, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for coming. Uh, there's hey Owen, you wrote, what is it about tension that is good for us? Go, go look on the YouTube channel. There's tons of videos on tension in there. Just type tension. I talk about it constantly. I do long talks and teachings because that's everything, man. That when you get a good relationship to tension and vulnerability, you'll change your entire life. Okay. Okay, buddy. Um, so the rest of you write your uh, questions into the Facebook page. And if you didn't get them answered and we'll see if we can get them answered there. Okay, guys, I want to thank Anthony for being here. He was awesome. Uh, his journey has been amazing. He's an amazing coach. He's helped so many of you guys out. He gets better each and every day, week and month that he's here. We, uh, he keeps growing and, and he's moving his way up towards living permanently in cap all the time, um, or at least 80% of the time. But, but, uh, and, he, and he's changing his life radically. Why? Because he chose it. He set it as a goal. He wanted it. He, he literally is committed to stepping into that level of tension that's going to create the reality that he wants in life. So, so, and that's, so you can do that too. And that's what I mean by the conf, uh, the confident, uh, only the confident really live because those are the people that are willing to get out there, get messy and do what needs to be done. Whether it's feeling like deep emotions and letting them go or taking physical actions to create the life of their dreams and to help others do the same. Cause that's a big part of it. So uh, with that said, if you happen to be watching a clip of this or part of this or all of this on YouTube, make sure to comment. We love your comments. If you're on the Facebook page, comment there. Uh, make sure to like if you haven't liked. Make sure to subscribe. Hit that notifications button if you're on YouTube. Uh, share the video. Share as much as you can. We love helping out as many people as you can. We love inspiring people. This is all free for everybody. So do that. And then invite people to the program. The, uh, it, the, the website's still up, thefearlessman.com slash 21 days. And if you got friends that you think could benefit from this, let them sign up. But, you know, especially with everybody sitting at home, let's inspire people. Let's get people out of fear. Let's get people to stop watching the news and start just getting the data and moving on and using this time to learn a new skill, to, uh, to do what they've always wanted to do. I mean, people, there's so many people just sitting home watching Netflix and it amazes me. I mean, if nothing else, you can be learning to play the guitar, learning to play music, learn, uh, exercise. There's so much you could do with your life. So let's inspire people and help them get out there and create amazing lives. Um, with that said, I'm going to uh, say it one more time. Remember, only the confident really live. Have a beautiful day, guys. Thanks.